Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here after lunch. It's going to be my pleasure to tell you about biominerals, which are the crystals formed by living organisms, and the ones that you're looking at in the background here, which are surprisingly perfectly co-oriented single crystals or calcite, though despite the fact that they are not looking like single crystals or calcite. They definitely don't have faceted morphology. They don't have sharp edges and flat faces. And most importantly, they appear to be topologically separate, yet they are perfectly co-oriented. So this is the mystery that I'm going to try to solve today with the experiments that I'm going to be presenting today. And specifically, we're going to be talking about crystals and proteins. So if you want to bring home only two words today, it's crystals and proteins. Well, the ALS is not only the high-tech, stupendous place that we all know and love. It can also have its bucolic moment, as you can see there. And not only the goats aspire to be users and staff people there, and I'm pretty sure they had to compete for graze time. And I'm pretty sure that that grass is oversubscribed by a factor of five as well. But the ALS is made by people, and it's the people at the ALS that make it a stupendous facility that it is. Because you can always improve the equipment, it becomes obsolete pretty quickly, and with the people and their vital energy, they really make the experiments work, and how to iron out all of the difficulties together is what makes the ALS experience. So the brilliant staff scientists that I worked with over the years, and most importantly, Andrea, Andrew, and Anthony, uh, with whom we do the PIM3 experiments that I'm going to discuss with you today. The other key people at the ALS were Howard, who uh, for the first time suggested I should be a user of PIM3. I was definitely not even thinking about it. I had my own microscope. I was perfectly happy. I had uh, my own beamline designed exactly to my spec for the SRC. And the last thing I was thinking of in early 2007 was to become a user of the PIM program here. But he insisted I did so. And that was the experiment that really changed my life. And I've never been able to stop since. Uh, the other key person is Roger, who very generously offered space in the new user support building to set up a lab that enabled all of the sample preparation that I'll show you and I'll specifically address why it was so key to the success of these experiments that the samples be prepared here, not back in Madison. And Rich then made it all happen with setting up that lab where I contributed the equipment, but he made it all work, and he's in charge of doing the maintenance. So when some other user comes and floods all of my code with oil, he's the one in charge and makes it work right away in record time. So I'm going to be telling you about searching biominerals, and those are the spines, the needles that we're all familiar with, hopefully not having, too having had too close an encounter with them. Uh, their teeth, their embryonic spicules, which are the biominerals that I'm mostly going to be showing data about today. There are three calcium carbonate mineral phases that are present in these searching spicules, these embryonic bones. And we identified them from their spectroscopic signature back in 2008. We measured their energetics, and then we detected the spatial distribution. And that's a paper we published earlier this year in PNAS. And from that, we deduced the kinetics of the space transitions. So this is just to give you a quick impression of where I'm going with this talk. But now let me just show you one image that should convey the fascination and Perhaps the motivation, if you are among those people that care about applications, I personally am not. I do this because of fundamental interest. Uh, but some of these spines, these searching spines, are single crystal. In fact, all of them are single crystals of calcite. But some of them can become as long as 25 centimeters. That's 10 inches. That's a very large size for a single crystal. And if we were to learn the tricks on how to build crystals that quickly, that and that perfectly and that large, then perhaps we could find very good uses that will have, uh, for example, um, large uh, silicon crystals for solar panels or carbon capture or you name it. So uh, we know how to grow calcite crystals in vitro, but they grow slow and they grow really small on the order of 10 microns a day. So a 25 centimeter crystal like that would take 70 years. 
in the animal that's grown in less than a month. So that gives you an order of magnitude of just how fantastic these biominerals are compared to anything we know how to do in the laboratory. And they're all formed a completely environmentally friendly condition, so room temperature, pressure, and so on. These are beautiful data from uh, beamline 1232, the microdiffraction beamline. They show you one of these micro spines. It's a small one, so I can show you an image at, at the SEM here that shows you the structure. This is the tip of one of those needles. They're identical, whether they're really small or really large, it doesn't make any difference structurally. The this, this scale bar here is 100 micron. And this is the lab with diffraction that shows you how you have um, a single crystal of calcite. So that entire really strange morphology that's very far from a calcite rhombohedron. We all know what a calcite rhombohedron looks like. Sharp edges, flat faces, slanted angles. That's what the rhombohedron looks like. Here, they, the two would diffract identically, but the morphology is clearly very different. And as I said, the size is very different. It took millions of years for that to grow, by the way, a crystal about this size. So, um, if we look at other biominerals, like the forming part of a searching tooth, as I mentioned on the first slide, these are single crystals of calcite. They would diffract exactly as we saw on those diffraction data from the microdiffraction beamline. Yet these are curved and intertwined, and they're not at all looking like single crystals. So how do they come to form? How do they come to achieve these amazing performances? The third type of biomineral that I'm going to tell you most about today is actually this uh, searching spicules that come from larvae or embryos. So shortly after fertilization of a searching egg fertilized with one sperm cell, approximately 30 hours after fertilization, there will be a small crystal appearing, which under the microscope appears as a single crystal. And in fact, if you use cross polarizers, you can see that this two spicules that look like three radiate star um, go dark every 90 degrees. That tells you that this is a birefringent single crystal of calcite, and as it is expected of a single crystal of calcite, it goes dark every 90 degrees. This is a slightly later developmental stage. It's called the prism. It occurs 48 hours after fertilization. This is approximately 36 hours after fertilization. And again, whenever the spicules are approximately horizontal, approximately horizontal, it goes dark. When it comes back to vertical, it's dark and dark again. At the beginning, the spicules uh, of the spicule formation, the first thing deposited is actually a rhombohedron. And you may be able to discern here the corner edges of this rhombohedron. The growth of these three radii, then, is not epitaxial growth of a crystal, one ion at a time from solution. It's actually one nanoparticle at a time, and it's not crystalline growth. It's actually amorphous material that's deposited first, one about 100 nanometer size nanoparticle at a time. Space is entirely filled. And finally, crystallinity propagates through the fully formed aggregate that space filling. So this, this amorphous phase that's deposited is transient. It's just a, a trick that the cells have developed to deposit more material faster. Uh, and then um, it will transform into calcite eventually, maintaining the morphology that was determined by the organism in a sac, basically, that determines the curved surface. In fact, spicules were the first uh, biomineral in which these very good friends and colleagues of mine back in 97, when I was not part of this study yet, uh, had discovered for the first time that there are indeed amorphous precursors to biomineral formation. And that turned out to be the case also for teeth, for bones, for almost all biominerals that are known thus far today. So using PIM, we discovered back in this 2008 paper that there are indeed three mineral phases. And so I'm going to mislead you a little bit by telling you that the first one 
is uh, amorphous calcium carbonate that, that I abbreviate ACC, so that's pretty much the only acronym I'm going to use today. Amorphous calcium carbonate is ACC. And the first phase is hydrated. The second phase is presumably anhydrous ACC. And the third phase is calcite. So I misled you in the sense that back then, in 2008, we didn't really know the sequence. We didn't know the red, green, and blue were in this sequence. Now we do, and I'll show you evidence for that. But just to keep your thinking, to guide your thinking as you're listening, red, green, blue, RGB is the easy way to remember three colors. And this is the sequence of faces. And I had them color-coded in all types of data I'm going to show you today. So back then, we could, by comparison, show uh, that this one phase and the third phase, the calcite phase, were identical to synthetic analogs that we could prepare in the laboratory. The intermediate phase, we didn't have an analog for. But we do know that these are three fundamentally distinct phases. In fact, if you look at peak one and peak three, those are identical. They really don't change across the two phases, across the calcium LH X-ray spectra. What does change are these peaks two and peak four, which in the first phase, they're just shoulders. In the second phase, one is a shoulder, one is a well-defined peak. And in the third phase, they're both well-defined, narrow, pointy peaks. So there's no way you have two, uh, a linear combination of two faces that have low, low peaks and one that has high, high peaks. There's no way you end up with one high, one low. So these have to be three fundamentally distinct phases, and in fact, it's linear combinations of these three that we find all over the place. However, back in 2008, we were only looking at the surface of these triradiate spicules, and that's a disaster. If you know anything about a PIM experiment, you want to stay as far as you can from a strongly three-dimensional sample. So that was not a particularly easy experiment to do, and it was a bit of a failure. Uh, but it was a first observation and a first discovery of these three phases. We then moved on and in the energetics of these phase transitions, in which we actually demonstrated first on synthetic analogs, on th synthetic materials, that the enthalpy of transformation from the hydrated phase of amorphous calcium carbonate to the anhydrous phase is indeed exothermic. It means it's energetically downhill to go from hydrated to anhydrous. And then it's, again, energetically downhill. It's a spontaneous reaction. If you let it go, it will go one, two, three in this direction uh, into the crystalline phases. The three stable anhydrous polymorphs of so calcium carbonate are vaterite, aragonite, and calcite. They occur synthetically. They occur geologically. They all look alike, energetically, spectroscopically, thermodynamically. So what we're measuring here, we're really saying that if you start with a hydrated phase, you'll go into an anhydrous and then finally a crystalline calcium carbonate. And what happens is that you lose energy. You go towards a more stable system all the time. So it makes sense that the sequence would be red, green, and blue, but we didn't know yet that that was the case. We did the energetics also of the biogenic materials, and they perfectly match the synthetic ones. So again very likely that that is the sequence from red to green to blue, but not proven yet. Until we get to the PIN data that we acquired last year and published this year in PNAS, in which we're looking at a spicule here. That's one of those triradiate spicules. We're not looking at the surface anymore. This is the key advantage. We actually embed it in epoxy, polish it, and then look at a stack of images. The key point is that the, the spicules are pr prepared here. They are from Californian sea urchins. Uh, and they are, in fact, prepared here on campus by, by my uh, uh, molecular biologist, Chris Killian, embedded here, polished here in the new lab that Roger and Rich Celestri uh, provided us with, um, and then coded, and finally, we analyzed them. And this takes less than uh, uh, 24 hours from the extraction from the embryo which is why we can catch these transient phases. The sample has to be fresh. So what we're looking at here is not really a single image. This is one spicule. This is another spicule. That's another spicule. Their long axis is perpendicular to the plane of the image. So we're looking at three spicules in this image. But it's not really an image. It's actually a stack 
of 121 images. And so for every pixel, and there's a million of them, a thousand by a thousand in this image, uh, you actually have a full calcium spectrum. So for every pixel, you can interrogate the system, and of course it's all highly automated with the software that we developed and which we distribute for free on my website. You can interrogate every pixel, you have the full spectrum, and figure out which best combina linear combination of these three faces fits the experimental spectrum in that pixel. And then you render the color of that pixel with the appropriate mixture of red, green, and blue according to additive color mixing and normal RGB imaging. So you see that the crystalline part is mostly blue, and it's mostly at the center, the calcitic center. This is, uh, the spicules are formed just like tree trunks. The stuff, new stuff is deposited at the outer diameters. Therefore, when you're looking at the cross section, you should have blue at the center, uh, green, and red respectively, and that's by and large what we observe. There is very little red, but mostly the green is at the outer rim as expected. For the first time, we could actually follow the, the sequence of the faces, and in fact we go from red to green to blue as we go from the outside of the spicule to the inside, and we have indeed the red, green, and blue, and the intermediate faces, which as expected, are yellow between red and green and cyan between green and blue. And in fact, if you look at the spectra extracted along this line, which is 20 pixels long, these 20 uh, spectra, which are from 15 nanometer pixels respectively, you see that this pick one, sorry, pick two leads and pick four legs, which shows you this sequence of transition of, of phases and respectively transition from red to green to from green to blue. Then we did another experiment that rules out all sorts of possible artifacts and radiation damage and other uh, sample prep problems that we could have introduced in principle, either by manipulating the sample or by acquiring this data. And in fact, what we did is the so-called time course in biology. So look at different developmental stages of these spicules, and we look at them 36 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours after fertilization, and we notice completely different spectral composition, which you can see at a glance. So here, the dominant colors are red and green at 36 hours. We go to 48 hours and the dominant color is green followed by blue and at 72 hours the dominant color is blue. These are all fresh spicules, they're analyzed less than 24 hours from extraction. The only difference is the uh, developmental stage of the embryos at the time of extraction. So, all of this was kind of expected, it's very reassuring, everything goes exactly um, according to what you would expect thermodynamically, and it's very cool, but it's not very interesting, because it's not surprising. What was surprising, and that we really didn't expect, is that there would be, in the middle of this fully crystalline material, some amorphous nanoparticles. These are magenta. If we can lower the lights, it would be much more visible. Can we lower the lights? Do you know how to do that? So magenta, I remind you, in case you, you need a refresher of your additive color mixing, is the uh, mixture of blue and red. Therefore, thank you. Therefore, we have uh, this intermediate phase that's actually the, the first and the third phase that you see there. And it's surprising because you would not expect that. It's no intermediate between two adjacent consecutive phases. We found that also in the 48 hour spicules. And in fact, we find it even more convincingly. This was before Roger gave us the space in the user support building. So this was back when we were preparing the sample in medicine. We looked at the spicule that was extracted and then analyzed four days later. This is how long it took to FedEx the speakers to medicine, embed, polish, coat, and fly them back with a student and analyze them here. And you see that there was still some amorphous all around. There's some cyan in the middle. Oh, perfect, thanks. And then you can see some uh, cyan and green here at the edge. But then analyzing the very same speaker, which we found two months later, it's entirely blue, but the magenta nanoparticles persist. 
And what that means is that there must be a protein that inhibits the dehydration transition. So the first one of these transitions uh, is inhibited by this protein. So if I try to come up with an energy landscape based on what we measured with the acid solution calorimetry in collaboration with Alex Navrowski that I showed you previously, we will have these three enthalpy levels, these three energy levels. The barriers in between must be very, very low because this red phase is very short-lived. We find red very sparsely and only at the outer rim. So basically, that has to be a very small barrier, quite comparable with the thermal KT. This barrier must be longer because the green phase is more long-lived. It has a longer lifetime. However, when we, because we observe these magenta nanoparticles that persist even two months later, we find that this basically inhibits the transition to the anhydrous phase, which means that this activation barrier becomes enormous. And in fact, I don't really have time to tell you, unfortunately, but we discovered which protein is the one very likely responsible for inhibiting dehydration and therefore enacting that. So to conclude, calcite biominerals in sea urchins have two amorphous precursor phases, as we discovered for the first time. And the sequence is indeed from hydrated to anhydrous ACC and then calcite, and that's shown by the energetics and by the spatial distribution in sea urchin spicules. And the proteins are those that control the space transitions. SM50 um, stabilizes this first phase, but those are data I really don't have time to show you, so let me skip to thanking my group, most importantly, Yutao and Ian and Chris Killian, who prepared all the speakers. Yutao and Ian, who uh, uh, set up the lab here, we reached the last three, and prepared all the samples and took all the data, and Yutao processed all the data, and that was very intensive data processing that you just saw. Brilliant collaborators all over the world, the most importantly here, Fred Wilt at UC Berkeley, Alex Navrowski at UC Davis, and finally, you, for your attention. Because the transition, thank you, that's a good question. Uh, because the transition to uh, anhydrous, so the dehydration is inhibited by the presence of a protein, and I'm very happy to report that we actually discovered which protein. It's called SM50. It's actually the most common uh, protein in every uh, sea urchin biomineral, in the spines, the spicules, the, the teeth, the test, all of them. And uh, what... Uh, if I have one more minute, I would actually show you more data that actually show you why I know that that's the protein that does that job. But. Okay, what the searching, one thing I left out is that if we prepare hydrated ACC synthetically, that transition to anhydrous and then crystalline will occur in about one second. In the animal, this takes, this takes about four days, three, four days. So what this means is that the animal wants to stabilize the space transitions, wants to inhibit this or slow down considerably this phase transition so that mineralization can occur con in a controlled fashion. It's all about control of physics and chemistry, and that's what biology is really good at doing, controlling the physics and the chemistry of the system. So basically, that's the advantage, slowing down. And sometimes it goes wrong, and uh, you find the magenta nanoparticles which are left behind. Yeah, so I don't expect that to have a terrific effect on sea urchin biominerals because they're not exposed to seawater. And these are eukaryotes. They're very highly developed um, uh, organisms that basically screen themselves from the water conditions. So, in fact, you can change the pH of the water quite a bit, and the pH inside the organism doesn't change, very much like in, in 
uh, human organisms. If you look at the pH, the salinity, you can swim in quite a diversity of different waters and you're not affected in your internal chemistry. Pretty much the same thing happens. These crystals appear to be outside. They do look like an exoskeleton in echinoderms, but they're actually endoskeleta. They are actually inside a thick layer of cells, which is probably why when you kick on one of these needles, he hurts so much. It's more the mechanical damage there. There's a lot of chemistry going on. Excellent. All right. Well, we're right on time. Thank you for keeping us on time and for a really fantastic talk. <laughs>